would it be fair to say that Assad has benefited a great deal the narrative that he has been able to really uh, sell and, and, and advance a particular narrative? that he is the embodiment, embodiment of sovereignty in Syria, he is the protector of minorities, he is fighting a greater uh, struggle for Arab nationalism, for nationalism, for diversity, for secularism. And this particular narrative, really, as you know, he has been hammering this particular, mm -hmm. just an interview today, three days ago, he said the Egyptian army and we are fighting the same war. Mm. It's the war against the Islamists, the war against these people who are trying to destroy the social fabric of our societies. Uh, do you think this has played a key role in his ability to at least maintain his social base of support? No, I think it has. I think in many I mean, he began right at the beginning by saying we're fighting terrorists when he wasn't. Um, and now he can say we're fighting terrorists, and much of the world would agree that he is. Um, and that was a consequence, partly because he went out of his way to sectarianize the conflict. If you look at what happened at the beginning, um, the Shabiha were basically sent up to create sectarian strife. Uh, and they did it fantastically well. And it did create this, um, either you join your own sect, your own religion, or you will be killed. Um, so he created the environment where you could basically uh, see that that was going to happen. These guys, many of the people now in Syria, they only had to drive back across the border from Iraq. I mean, they'd gone in via Syria, and then they'd come back again. Um, they were supported by Syria and Iraq. They have come back to fight, to, to fight the Syrian regime. But you're absolutely right. You know, Assad now has a pretty good case to make to people that are worried about Islamic extremism around the world. And he's been doing it very well. And I think the irony of where we are now is it wasn't very long ago that people said Assad must go. And now they'd quite like him to stay at least until next year when they get rid of their chemical weapons. And frankly, maybe stand a little bit longer until we work this out. So he's seen his... You know, this is a man who's, who's presided over mass murder, torture, rape, 100,000 people being killed, chemical weapons being used, and now he's being allowed to wander around, well, not the, the world, but wander around the, the international stage, in inverted commas, as a statesman again. I mean, it's a real turnaround. It's incredible. You had John Kerry praising the regime for, for being quite helpful in terms of uh, uh, getting rid of the chemical weapons. Now, you know, that's pretty catastrophic when you think about so, what we were, so where we were a couple of years what ago. What did the West get wrong about Syria? The West didn't want to get involved. I mean, I think a big part of it is it was going to be messy. They didn't want to get involved. They took their eye off the ball in 2012 because of the American elections. The Israelis, and I've met a lot of people in the Israeli military and intelligence establishment, at the beginning, they didn't want him to go. And then when they thought he was going to go, they said, just let's get rid of him quick. And they didn't get either one of those. Uh, and it's, I think, you know, if you, if you look on the bigger picture, it's a massive failure of American foreign policy that its most important ally, Israel, now has al-Qaeda on its border. I mean, the, the conflicts that Israel used to fight people over were about land. It was, you know, it, these were resistance groups, Hezbollah or Hamas, largely about land. And now they have on their border a fight over God, over a religion, whether it be in the Sinai or whether it be uh, on the Syrian border. So it's, that's a big problem for Israel, because you can have a negotiation about land. It's very, very hard to have a negotiation about God. Um, you just... People often don't agree. So after all, it's not good to have all of, all of the jihadis in one place. Well, <laughs> depends where you live, I guess. Um, there are certainly a lot of people that would be quite happy to have them all in Syria, I imagine. Well, you know, I mean, surely if you were living in Lebanon, or if you were living in or would Istanbul, I think or Baghdad, you you'd would be not, very you unhappy. You would not say what we're saying now. No, no, we wouldn't. Place, we're, would it? We, no, we certainly wouldn't. But I think that's, that's, that's the European perspective, that's and we are. Final, final, final footnote, just to three ideas about why we got Syria wrong and see whether you, you buy what I'm going to say. Far, we have seen very few defections in the Syrian army. Think how much we have heard about the Syrian army. Think of how few defections have taken place. You can count them on, on our really uh, dozens or yeah, so. Very few. The idea is not because they're worried about their beloved ones, could it be that the Syrian army is an ideological army built over 40 years to maintain the political regime, unlike the Tunisian and army? And the identity of Syria, yeah. Point two. Could it be that we have underestimated the social base, the social support of Assad? Is it, is it fair to say 30%, including a sizable Sunni segment of the Novorish and the business class and the urban, that fighting to the bitter end? 
is it fair to say that we underestimated the geostrategic nature of the struggle? That somehow really what's happening in Syria is not just a Syrian war, it's really multiple wars by proxies and the Iranians are fighting to the bitter end to maintain so-called the axis of resistance. And in this particular sense, as you said, comes to the unwillingness of American foreign policy to get engaged in another major theater in the Middle East. I, I, agree, I, I think you're, I agree with all of that. So I there's really more to, I mean, we're getting Syria wrong than just failure on American foreign policy. No, no, I mean, it, 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 it was, I remember speaking to someone in the UN and they basically said, um, America missed the train, the West missed the train, the Europeans missed the train, they left it to the Arab League and the Arab League radicalized it. And I think that's a fairly, fairly sensible way of looking at it because at the end of the day, I think we, when the Arab Spring happened, the instincts of the West was, let's try and keep a bit of stability here. Let's try and, you know, we've got to worry about Israel, we've got to worry about oil. So they, they tried to keep things stable. Once the Gulf states worked out that they dealt with their home problems, they looked at the region and said, well, we can't stop it, we can't make it stable, so let's try and shape it. Let's try and see what we can get out of this. And I think that was the thing, you're absolutely right, the Gulf states saw an opportunity, and the West saw a big problem. And that's, you know, the Qataris, Qataris like to have friends. I mean, small countries like to have friends, and they just spent lots of money trying to buy up lots of friends. The Saudis saw it as an opportunity to put Iran back in its box. Iran used to be boxed in by the Taliban and by Saddam. The Americans took both of those away, and that made the Saudis worried and nervous, and they saw the Arab Spring as an opportunity to basically put things back in order. So I think you're absolutely right. I think the, you know, the, 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 it's, it was never going to be easy in Syria, but there was never much of a chance given to the people that were trying to, 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 to get rid of Assad. Mm -hmm.